Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. So we're going to continue with the laws of Talmud Torah, of Torah study. And last time, we said that there were three big issues, really, in the first chapter. The first concerned inclusion. The second was the economics of Torah study. And the third, was, which we're going to focus on today, is about the syllabus and content of Torah study. So I think that one of the main things that we uh, pointed out last time is that there's a distinction, so I want to argue, between education and Torah study. Education is, must be a general presupposed re requirement for everybody, according to the Ramam. Otherwise, it would be impossible to uh, fulfill the most basic commandments that we've talked about since the beginning of the book. You wouldn't be able to understand that there is a God on the basis of the natural world, and you wouldn't be able to understand that this God is one and incorporeal and so on. You must have to have education for that, and you must have to edu have education in order to know the basis of the, of the practical laws as well. So I want to distinguish education in that sense which is required for all of the commandments, from the specific commandment of Talmud Torah. The specific commandment of Talmud Torah, as we saw last time, the Rambam thinks pertains as an obligation to men, but is permitted to women. But as I say, education must be for men and women and for everybody. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do now is focus on the syllabus and content of Talmud Torah. And that's really just two of the laws in this chapter, laws 11 and 12 of the first chapter of Hilchas Talmud Torah. And we'll see that this is where you begin to grasp the radicalism of Rambam's rethinking of, of Judaism. I think every political system and every religion has a third rail that's very dangerous to touch. I've heard it said in, in America, it's, the, uh, it's social security. <laughs> in Judaism, it's the syllabus of Torah study. That is dangerous stuff. And what we'll see is that the Rambam makes a very radical proposal and that the later codes tried to reverse that uh, view. Even if they used some of his words, they basically wanted to put forward a view that was really the exact opposite of his. So the basis for the discussion is a Gemara in Kiddushin 30a, which is a little bit mysterious. That's the first text on the handout. The Olam Yishalesh Adam Shnosov. A person should always divide his years into three. When I was a boy, we had to learn um, Caesar's Gallic Wars, which begins with Gaul is divided into three. But this is uh, your years you're supposed to divide into three. Bamikra uh, Shlish, sorry, Shlish Bamikra, a third in uh, scripture, Shlish Bamishnah, a third in the Mishnah, Shlish Talmud, and a third in the Talmud. Gemara immediately asks a question Miodea Kamachaye, how long, how do you know, who, who knows how long you're going to live? So the, the assumption behind the question is that what it means is, you start from knowing when you're going to die, <laughs> then you divide it into three. Uh, that clearly is not what the uh, original statement. So what does it mean? Um, lo, no, tzricha yume. It's, it's necessary. The statement is necessary, for, but it really applies to one's days. But even that is not so clear. So different ways to read that. Um, one opinion is that you divide each day. Each day you spend a third of the time on the Bible, a third of the time on the Mishnah, and a third on the Talmud. Uh, and it may be that in, it's, in, it's partly in following that that we have a um, certain amount of learning, of Torah study, that's incorporated into our Siddur. And we have a little extract from each, already the very beginning of the morning service. Um, but there are other opinions as well. So let's see how the Rambam understands it. So... Chapter 1, Halakha 11 of Hilchas Talmud Torah, Laws of Torah Study. 
One is obligated to divide the time of one's study into three. Shlish betorah bichtav, a third in the written Torah, a shlish betorah shebalpeh, a third in the oral Torah, ushlish yavin v'yaskil achar is davim me reishiso. A third one should reflect and deduce conclusions from premises, v'yotzi davar mi davar, and one should develop the implications of statements, v'yidameh davar le davar, one should compare one thing to another, v'yavin b'mida shahatorah nidroshes b'hen, and one should study the hermeneutical principle. So, um, right, a third to the written law, a third to the Torah, to the oral law. And then, so what, what is Rambam paraphrasing here? Which word is he explaining? If you go back to the Gemara. Reflection. No, the word in, in the Gemara, in the first text. Oh. A third for Bible, a third for Mishnah, and a third yeah. for... What's the third item in the Gemara? Uh, Talmud. Talmud. Mm-hmm. Now... If I ask you, what is the Talmud? You might point to a bookshelf Mm -hmm. and a book that's on the bookshelf. The Rambam does not believe that Talmud is a book. Talmud is a discipline. Now, it happens that we have a book that contains an exemplary uh, collection of things connected to that discipline. And we call it by extension Talmud, but that's like saying that, you know, what's physics? Well, it's what is, then you point to the physics textbook, right? The physics is not the the book. Physics is the discipline, right? So for him, Talmud is the discipline that he's describing. It's not a book at all, right? Um, So until you know, what's the essence of the principles? And how to deduce what's permitted and what's forbidden from uh, uh, and similar things midvarim shelamam piashmo of the things that you've learned orally. So you you have to understand the logical structure of what has been transmitted orally. So in other words, Torah shabiktav is scripture. Torah shabalpeh is oral tradition. But the third discipline of, of Talmud is to understand the logical structure the connection between the two, and the basis of the laws, and how legal reasoning works. Mm. Okay. And he says, mm. This is what's called Gemara, or Talmud, in some versions of the text. Right. Does this leave a lot of leeway for people to interpret things their own way? Um, it doesn't seem like there's more of a set. Right. Standard of what you think. Yes. They might be opening up. Right. But it's also true that there there is there is some authority here that's operating, and there's also the need for um, shared legal principles. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I, I think you're right that it does leave room for independent thinking, uh, but it doesn't mean I th- you know that every individual should do it the way they want to do it. Okay, so is the Rambam yeah. right? I mean, we yeah, always saw this was that the Rambam is because he does in, in his introduction to the Mishnah Torah, he's very clear that he's not going to be quoting any text from the Gemara or the Talmud. Yes. So is he ostensibly saying that he personally can rewrite the Talmud and? make his own Talmud and potentially others can make their own Talmud, do you think, do you see? Well, again, I, I would... I always saw him as trying to kind of re- rewrite the Talmud because he tells people that they don't need it because he's going to make it very clear. And if you say re- rewrite the Talmud, you're still assuming that the Talmud is a book. Meaning rewrite what the Talmud was. Yes. I won't say rewrite, fine, I'll say to replace. To replace what the Talmud was, he's going to be doing it by by being involved in deduction and implications, etc. Yes. So his analysis can replace that to some extent. So, I mean, you could use the Mishnah Torah, Mishnah Torah, yes. right? Right. So we're going to read and, that part of the introduction again soon. What I would say, though, is 
yes and no. He will replace the Talmud within the curriculum. Right. Now, there may be other advanced scholars and judges who will need to consult the Talmud. That is to say, the old, earlier book version. So he's not suggesting get rid of it. Um, but most people won't need to do that. They'll be sufficient for them to study the method of Talmud and to read his book. Right. So reading his book yeah. would be learning the, reading his book would be the Talmud. Well, reading his book will be uh, Torah Shabal Peh, I would say. That's right. So, so this is the law. You still need to study the discipline of reasoning. And his book is not teaching you that. So Talmud is actually um, the method. Now, you could try to figure out the method from his book compared with Torah Bechtav, for example. And a lot of people work that way. Um, but, so I would, I would say that Rambam is, um, you know, his book is written in the style of the Mishnah. It is a compendium of e more easily accessible and, and well uh, clearly presented laws. So that will teach you the oral part of the Torah. It does not make studying Talmud as a discipline redundant. You still need to do that. Um, but to study the Talmud Bavli or Yerushalmi as a text, that would be a very specialized thing. And not everybody would need to do that. And until this time, uh, you have to remember that when, you know, when the Ramam is writing, there are still the major yeshivot in Israel and in Babylonia. And they have huge amounts of authority and power. Uh, and uh, that their focus of study is a text called the Talmud. And uh, the, there's still people called Gaonim who are recognized as worldwide authorities in, in Jewish law. And people write to them from Spain and from Europe. Uh, and he's basically replacing that whole system. He's challenging the system. So he's saying you can do away with the Talmud if you follow his... Talmud. No. <laughs> yeah. You still have to learn it. Yes. You, you have, have to, to learn, learn the Talmud method Bavli. of Talmud. No, you don't. No, no. Not Talmud Bavli. That's a book. You have to learn the method of Talmud. And what his book does is to give you a compendium of the oral Torah. Right? And is this, when he's talking about the Shlish, is talking about Roma Lamed or Lama Because to some extent, you could say the Mishnah Torah, mm -hmm. um, the, and then when we get to the production, maybe you'll explain this a little bit. Yeah. The, the idea is really for people practically to have yes. a practical Yes, right, it's practical. So in yes. that way, the Talmud was unnecessary for him mm -hmm. in this text. Okay, because he wanted to give them the practical... Yeah, the Talmud does not tell you that this is not practically about, what to do. That wasn't about Talmud study. That right. wasn't about, sorry, Torah study. That was about practical. Yes. Like what to do. But here he's talking about, here he's talking about learning. Yeah. So he can't say that the Talmud is absolute. He can't, he can't say don't utilize it because that, that's separate from, that's separate from what I said, what you're supposed to do. Talmud Bavli and Yerushalmi are not very accessible ways either of learning what is practically uh -huh. the thing to do okay. or of studying the method. You can learn the method from them, obviously, but it's very difficult. Um, and there may be other ways to do it. And indeed, you know, one response to this later on was the uh, book of Rabbi Yitzchak Kampantong, which tries to tell you what the methodology of Talmud really is. But Talmud doesn't tell you what its methodology is, it just does it. Uh, so really, you would need to study that method as well. But it could be that that method, um, it's a question. Is, is the method of Talmud something so distinctive and different from any other kind of reasoning that you'd have to study it from the Talmud, Bavli, and Yushami themselves? Or is it like general logical reasoning? Uh, nothing in the Rambam indicates that there's anything distinctive about Talmudic reasoning. So learning logic and learning analogical reasoning and so on uh, would be sufficient, and you would have to learn how to apply that. But you're applying to the Mishnah. You take the Mishnah, and then you 
apply this reasoning well, to the Mishnah so that you're coming out with thoughtful reasoning? You could take the Mishnah, you could take the Rambam's Mishnah Torah, which tells you what the practical halakha is. The Mishnah always, you know, often tells you several opinions, and uh, you'd have to know what the rules are in order to know which one to follow. But the Rambam's just going to tell you what he thinks is the right thing to do most of the time. Occasionally he'll tell you different opinions, but it's quite rare. But if he gives you his opinion, then you're not using your own reasoning Correct. to figure it right, out. Because he's already done it. He's done it. So you can work backwards from what he did and try and figure that out. But yeah, in a way it limits you because he's, um, done, it he's done it already. And that's what a lot of the halakhic authorities objected to. Not only was he challenging their authority by putting his book in, in, in their place, but he was coming to conclusions that they didn't necessarily agree with. Okay, so here's the 12th halacha, gives us an example. Ketzad, how does it work? Hayab bal umnus, if somebody was an artisan, by ozek b'mlachta sholash shoz, b'yom, and suppose he had to work for three hours a day. I don't find this very interesting that someone could make a living working three hours a day. It tells you something about the economy. Right? But Torah teisha, and then he's got nine hours left for studying Torah, right? Because that's 12 hours. And the other 12 are for sleeping and eating and other things that you need to do with your family and for your health, right? But that's 12 hours. So of those nine hours, you take three and you study written Torah, right? Another three hours for the oral Torah. And for the three other hours, that's when you... Um, reflect on how to deduce one rule from another. So you're dividing each day, in other words. Okay, so you, you might have thought he would stop there. Right? He's followed the opinion, which is one interpretation of the Gemara, that you divide it up in three, but he's given a, a novel interpretation of what Talmud is. But it's not, we're not done yet. Right? Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, one, I missed. Right. Uh, and the words of tradition are included in the written Torah. But their explanation is included in the oral Torah. Okay. So in other words, it's not just the written text itself, but uh, he uh, in the translation is the words of the prophets. Okay. Um, so there's... All right. Let, let's move on to the next phrase. Those things that are called pardes, So Talmud includes pardes. And we said before, when we learned the foundations of the Torah, the pardes, which is a Persian word for orchard, means the um, advanced study of Maase Bereshis and Maase Merkava, which the Rambam identified as physics and metaphysics. Right, so he does not think that we have uh, a Jewish tradition about those subjects particularly, although we have some uh, sort of particularly Jewish approaches to it. Uh, but fundamentally, that's the study of philosophy. So that is included in Talmud because Talmud is a discipline. And the discipline of, of rational reflection includes the rational reflection on the natural world and on the creation. Uh, and on the uh, both the creation and the governance of the natural world. I'm to stop you. Yeah. The Shvar path for the Rambam is Mishnah. Well, it's all of the, it's not only Mishnah. I mean, it would also be Mitra Shalacha. Mitra Shalacha. Yes. It's, right. It's Brighton. It's, it's the Sefta. It's like right. That, Think, but is it anything yes. we don't like? Does it include like commentaries on? Or things like that, or is that just no? I don't think so. It's really it's just, things yeah. that are uh, either in addition to um, you know things that are not mentioned at all in Torah um, Shabbat or some you know something about the the, the exposition of Torah Shabbat how we how we understand it. That that would be the third, the last third. No, that's Torah Shabbat says. But you just said the exposition should be the name of the no. no, no. In other words, not 
Not the method of exposition, but the content of the exposition. No, what you just described is a method. No, I'm saying there are traditions that we have, like how do you I, how do you make tefillin? How do you make tefillin, right? So that's all halacha lemosha misina. It's things that we have a that very ancient tradition. Kavala, bichlal, tosh, it would be deeper kavala. Um, I, I I don't think it is. I think it's. Uh, in, that is part of Torah Balper, I believe. Um, I think, yeah, I think Divrei Kabbalah means other written traditions. That's why in the English translation it says the words of the of the prophets. So that would be in addition to. So it's not only the Chum, the Chumash, but it's also it's not only the Pentateuch but it's other parts of the written scripture that is connected to the Mosaic revelation as well. Okay, so the philosophical studies are included in Talmud. What are we talking about? We just said that you divide it up into three, right? That's when a person is starting out in their studies. This is elementary study, but not advanced study. Right? So this is adding something that was not in the uh, in the Gemara at all. Avol kasha yagdil b'chachma, but when a person becomes proficient in wisdom, v'lo yehet sarich lo lelamed lo lel mod Torah shevichtav, and you don't need to learn written Torah, v'lo laasok tamid b'Torah shebape, or to constantly occupy yourself with oral Torah, because you know all that already. Then you should read those. You should review them at fixed times. So you don't forget. So you've got to learn it, and then you review it at regular intervals. But you don't need to spend all your time on it. Rather, you should devote all your days exclusively to Gemara Bilvad to Gemara or Talmud Bilvad which is the method of inference, which includes philosophy. According to the breadth of his mind and the maturity or the uh, tranquility of his, uh, um, of, of, his, of his intellect. So to the extent of, of a person's ability, they should get to a point where they just have to review what they've already learned and then they can free themselves to study the method of inference and philosophy. So now we begin to see why this is a very radical program and why the Mishnah Torah is necessary. Because if you were to spend all of your time, or at least the bulk of your time, trying to master the book of the Babylonian or the Yerushalmi Talmud, which takes a lifetime, you know, then you would never get to this part. You would never get to this uh, stage of studying philosophy. Yes. And clearly, Rambam thinks that's very important. If we go back now, this is the next thing, you know, something that we studied right at the beginning, uh, to the introduction. Right, so he mentioned right, the several reasons why he needed to write this book. Right, this, the state of the oral law was pretty uh, dismal, he thought. Right? So he said that, you know, look, on the one hand, the Babylonian Talmud is authoritative for all Jews, but the Talmud is very difficult to understand as a book and to glean its practical results. On the other hand, the Geonim, that is to say the, the heads of the, of the academies, have written only uh, partial accounts that were really for their own communities, and they never put together anything that was completely comprehensive and clear. At this time, he also says, we've been beset by additional difficulties. Everyone feels financial pressure, uh, also persecution. The wisdom of our sages has become lost. The comprehension of our men of understanding has become hidden. Therefore, these explanations, laws, and replies, which the Gaonim composed and considered to be fully explained material, have become difficult to grasp in our age. So even if they were intelligible in an earlier generation, where they had a, a better situation, Remember, the Rambam, had, with his family, had to flee from, uh, from Spain to North Africa and from North Africa to Egypt because of the Almohad persecution and conversion of the Jews. Right? 
Only a select few comprehend these matters in the proper way. So people don't really understand the Talmud. Therefore, he says, I girded my loins, I, Moshe ben Maimon of Spain. I relied upon the rock, blessed be he. I contemplated all these texts, right? So he studied all the rabbinic texts, all the uh, Midrashay Halakha, as well as the, uh, both the Talmuds, the Bavli and the Rishalmi. This is what he did when he was being supported by his brother David, before the ship went down with the family money. Right? That's what he did. And I sought to compose a work which would include the conclusions derived from all these texts regarding the forbidden and the permitted, the impure and the pure, and the remainder of the Torah's laws, all in clear and concise terms, so that the entire oral law could be organized in each person's mouth without questions or objections. Right, so this is Torah Shabal Peh. That's the way I understand it. It's, it's not exactly Talmud, but it is, it's more than the Mishnah tells you. Right, it's a new Mishnah. Instead of arguments, this one claiming such and another such, this text will allow for clear and correct statements based on the judgments that result from all the texts and explanations mentioned above. From the days of Rabbeinu HaKadosh, that would be um, Rabbi, Hu Rabbi Huda, who uh, finally uh, compiled the Mishnah, until the present. This will make it possible for all the laws to be revealed to both those of lesser stature and those of greater stature regarding every single mitzvah, and also all the practices that were ordained by the sages and the prophets. To summarize, the intent of this text is that a person will not need another text at all with regard to any Jewish law. Rather, this text would be a compilation of the entire oral law, the Torah Shabbat Peh, including also the ordinances, customs, and decrees that were enacted from the time of Moses, our teacher, until the completion of the Talmud. So it, it includes not only the oral tradition that Moses received, but all of the new enactments that have been made since then as well, as were explained by the Geonim, by the heads of the academies in the text they composed after the Talmud. What about, what about the... Um the Shulchan Aruch. Does this does does the Shulchan Aruch replace this? This is pre Shulchan. This was pre Shulchan Aruch. Right. So the Shulchan Aruch replace. Ah uh, um, well, the the Shulchan Aruch comes later and is only interested in the practical laws. However, there's a very big difference of, of approach for several reasons. Uh, there is a different philosophy underlying the Shulchan Aruch, as we'll see in a minute. I'll show you a passage from it. And secondly, the Shulchan Aruch uh, is interested in um, the way in which authoritative decisions have been made. Rambam is trying, for the most part, to give his own systematic and consistent view of the way halacha should go. The Shulchan Aruch certainly has his own systematic view, but it's largely based on what other authorities have already said. It is not independent-minded in quite the same way. Okay. Therefore, the Rambam continues, I have called this text Mishnah Torah, the second to the Torah, uh, with the intent that a person should first study the written law. So that this is the, the syllabus, right, that we just learned inside. Um, and then study this text and comprehend the entire oral law from it without having to study any other text between the two. So the Talmud Bavli is gone from the syllabus. I'm not saying it's gone from the bookshelf or the, from the library. Advanced students may want to consult it, but it's not in the syllabus now. Right. Um, I saw fit to divide this text into separate halachas pertaining to each particular subject. Within the context of a single subject to divide those halachas into chapters, each and every chapter is divided into small halakha so they can be ordered in one's memory. So this is exactly the sort of book that you need to achieve mastery of the Torah Baal Peh, and then you can move on to Talmud, and you can in particular move on to philosophy. Even though he didn't say that in the introduction, I think it should now be clear that that's a large part of what he has in mind. So that is a radical program, and I would say that for the most part, although no doubt there were people in Rambam's community and maybe in his family who followed this, uh, for the most part, this has not been accepted. And the attempt to remove the Talmud Bavli from its place at the center of uh, 
of Jewish education has been a failure. <laughs> Whether it's a good idea or a bad idea is another question, but this, this has, not, has not worked the way the Rambam uh, thought. Let's have a look at the way the later codes use his words against his project. So the first major code that I want to look at next is the Arba Turim, the four columns of Rav Yaakov ben Asher. So Rav Yaakov ben Asher was the son of the Rosh, and that, his family came from Ashkenaz, they came from the German-speaking lands in the 13th century. They came to Spain, but they carried with them a certain amount of Ashkenazi practice. And, and the philosophical focus that you see in the Rambam, that was within a, a very particular group of people in Spain and in southern France, Provence, um, and then maybe in, in Egypt where the Rambam was. It never really came up to northern Europe. So they did not have his texts. They didn't know of his texts. They learned of his texts because his texts were translated into Hebrew and the Mishnah Torah was written in Hebrew. But they did not know very much philosophy. They were not studying philosophy with their uh, non-Jewish neighbors the way the Rambam clearly was studying philosophy with his Arabic-speaking neighbors. There was a different culture, different relationship in, with the non-Jewish society. So the part of the Gemara, of, of Rambam's Gemara, which dealt with philosophy, they were not a part of that. Right. They did have some philosophical traditions, uh, which were partly from Sa'aja Gaon and from the translation of Sa'aja into, from Arabic into Hebrew. But they didn't have the same relationship with their neighbors for the most part. Uh, and you'll see that they focused even more than the Sephardim and the uh, Eastern Middle Eastern Jews on Talmud Bavli in particular as a book. You'll see that in a minute. So here's Rabbi Yaakov ben Asha. So this is the top of page three. Right? V'chai of the Shalesh Limudo. One is obliged to divide his study into three. So by now these words should be familiar. Mm -hmm. It's the Gemara, but it's paraphrased by Rambam and now again by the Tur. Right? Shlish b'Torah, Shlish b'Mishnah, Shlish b'Talmud. A third in the Torah, a third in the Mishnah, a third in the Talmud. Perish, explanation. But Torah, Torah shebichtav. When, when you say Torah, you mean written Torah. Kamo Torah v'yim k'suvim. Like the Tanakh, right? the Pentateuch, the writings, and the prophets. Um, Mishnah, hu Torah shebal peh. Hu perush Torah shebichtav. Hu bichlal zeh. So Mishnah means the oral Torah and the explanation, including the explanation of the Torah Shabbatav. The Talmud, who she, now notice that he quotes the Rambam's explanation of Talmud. So you should reason and reflect and, and draw consequences and inferences and, and so on, and analogies. And you should know the... Um, the methods by which the Torah is expounded, until you know what the foundation of the commandments is, and how to derive the laws of what's prohibited and what's permitted. With respect to things you heard from oral tradition. All of this sounds very, very much like the Rambam, but you're going to see that it really goes in a different direction. Kate said, what kind of case are we talking about? Hayabal Umnas, so there was an artisan for Osek ben Malacha, Shalashas, and he had to work for three hours a day to make a living. Betesha uh, Osbe Torah, and that gives him nine hours left over for Torah, again, making 12 hours. Kara Gimel Mehen Torah Shevich Tav, three of those hours he reads, or his written Torah, Begimel Torah Shebaal Peh, three studies the Torah Shebaal Peh, Begimel Yavin Dovin Vitoch Dovah. And for three, he engages in Talmudic inference. Because of Harambam, and the Rambam wrote, what are we talking about? 
we're talking about the beginning of a person's studies. Once someone becomes proficient, uh, he doesn't need to learn the written Torah or to occupy himself constantly with the oral Torah. He should review at set times the written Torah and the oral tradition. Um, so he doesn't forget anything. Uh, and he should be, be concerned with Talmud alone according to his abilities. But now look what the tour adds. Right, so Rabbeinu Tam is a grandson of Rashi, who um, is an authority of the Ashkenazi tradition. Rabbeinu Tam said, and this is from a Tosfus on the same page of the Gemara that we saw before, Kedushin 30a. Sha'anu Somchin Ahada Issa Bissan. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, it is on the. Yeah, it is there. Um, that we rely on what it says in a different Gemara in Sanhedrin, Kavdalad Amud Aleph, Sanhedrin 24a. Talmud Bavli, Balul Bamikra Bamishnah Batalmud. The Babylonian Talmud is um, mixed up. Of it's a combination of scripture, Mishnah, and Talmud. And through it alone, we fulfill our obligation. So we Ashkenazim only study Talmud Bavli. Because we have all three. Yeah, that just contains all three. So having quoted almost word for word what the Rambam says, goes completely in the opposite direction and makes the. So not only is the Talmud. The um, back in the syllabus, so it never left really, right? But it's it's even bigger part of it than it would have been for for in the Rambam's day because they it seems like they didn't really spend very much time studying Torah Shabbat Tav. They spent very little time on the Bible. They did a little bit, and then as soon as the kids were able, boys, of course, you know they they started Talmud very early, and they didn't spend time on Mishnah separately either. Everything was all mixed up. Now that's based on this Gemara, which I gave you as text number six, Sanhedrin 24a. It's a play on words. It says, my Bavel. What does the word Bavel mean? Of course, Bavel is a place name, Babylonia. Oh, but it's a pun on the name. It says, Bal Balula, Rabbi Yochanan says, it's Balula Bamikro, Balula Bamishnah, Balula Batamit. So it's mixed with Bible, Mishnah, and Talmud. It combines all three. And on the basis of that, the Ashkenazim. Uh, had a syllabus that focused mainly on the Talmud Bavli. It doesn't say anything about Pardes or about philosophy there at all. And if you're going to learn inference, it's going to be from the text of the Talmud Bavli. So that's the next major code after the, uh, after the Rambam. So using his words almost entirely, but reaching the opposite conclusion. And then couple of, a little bit later, you get the Shulchan Aruch. So this is after the expulsion from Spain, when it's very important to consolidate the halachic tradition. You've, you know, people had lost a lot of the local traditions, their communities didn't exist anymore. And Rav Yosef Karo, who was himself in exile, puts together, um, first of all, a commentary on the, on, on the Mishnah Torah, then a commentary on the tour, and finally uh, his own little sort of compendium, and at the same time, you've got someone in Ashkenaz doing the same thing, Rav Moshe Isilis, so they're contemporaries. And, and when Rav Moshe Isilis heard that Rav Yosef Kara had already completed his version, he thought, there's no point in my publishing a separate book. Instead, I will put what I want to say about Ashkenazi tradition as a, an additional gloss on what Rav Yosef Kara was doing, and we'll have one book for all the Jewish people. So that's what actually happened. So Shulchan Aruch means the, the laid table. It's all laid in front of you. And Moshe Islis called his book Mapa. It's the tablecloth. <laughs> so we'll see what they say now. Again, it's going to sound very s similar, but it, it, it will go in a slightly different direction, right? Chaya Vadam the Shalish Limudo. A person is obliged to divide his study into three. Shlish Batar Shaviktav. Tahainu Ha'arba Esrim. A third in the written Torah, which is the 24 books of the Tanakh. Shlish right. um, Mishnah, 
a third in the Mishnah, Dahainu Torah Shabal Peh, which is the oral Torah. Perush, that Torah Shabitab Bichlal Zeh. And how to ex- understand the, the written Torah is included in that. Shlish B'Talmud. And then a third in the Talmud. Dahainu Shayavan Vyaskal Achras Dava Meir Shiso, Vyotzi Dava Mitokto, Vyibit Dava Ladava. And again, that language comes almost exactly from the Rambam. Talmud means this method of inference. So they all cite that, but they don't, they're not going to draw his radical conclusion from it, which is that you can now put aside, for the most part, the actual book, which we call the Talmud. Uh, until you know what the foundation of the commandments is. And how to get the... Uh, the forbidden and the prohibited from it, and so on. Devarim shalamad and piashmua, so you can derive the things that we also know from oral tradition. Ketzad, what's an example? Hayo baluminus, you had an artisan, for osek mimlato gimel shas, biyom, he had to work for three hours a day, and tes betorah, he's got nine hours left for Torah. Kore gimel mehem betorah shabichtav, he should read three hours in the written Torah. Begimel Torah Shabal Peh three in the Torah Shabal Peh Begimel Yavin Dov Mi Tochtov of Ahmed Devor Mum. Okay, so then three you should involve in reflection again. All of that's from the Rambam. Ahmed Devor Mumurim. What is that talking about? Bechilas the Mudoshel Adam, the beginning of a person's study. Avol Kasher Yagdil B'Torah. Notice that in the other cases it said when you grow in Chachma, in wisdom. Here it says in, in Torah. It's a little different. He doesn't allow for any other Chachma. And you no longer need to study the written Torah or to occupy yourself continually with the oral Torah. Then you should read and review at regular intervals the written Torah and the words of the oral Torah. It doesn't say anything about paradise. And he doesn't, although he quotes the Rambam's definition, uh, one can assume that just like the conclusion of the tour, by Talmud he still means the book. Now, the Ramah. Excuse me, yes. it says, yes. how is that different from. Um, the Rambam. It's not. It's his words. But but he doesn't say that it includes Pardes, and he will assume, like the tour, that we're talking about the book, the Talmud Bavli itself. Now, Ramosha Isilis, the Ramah, who was the halachic authority in Prague, so that's in Central Europe, was interested in philosophy. He was. Yes. Mm-hmm. However, as we'll see, he did not take the same radical view as the Rambam. He's not trying to change the syllabus. Isn't he also very scared for people to go in there? You didn't think that they were ready to go in there. They should be careful when they go in there. Is that the Rambam's yeah, view? Yeah, but that's right. Okay, so we'll, we'll see exactly what the Rambam's view, right? right? Yes. Okay, so... Um, He's not trying to change the Jewish curriculum at all. But he does want to leave room for people to study philosophy, and he wants to note that. Right, so this is uh, the last text. Hagos. So this is an, an, a gloss of the Ramah that he attaches to the paragraph we just read. V'yesh omrim shebetalmud bavli shehu balul b'mikra v'mishnah v'gemara adam yodzei yodei chavaso v'shvilakol. Some people say... And of course, he means Rabbeinu Tam, as quoted by the tour, that you fulfill all your obligations just with the Talmud Bavli itself, because it's mixed of, it's mixed up out of the um, scripture, the Mishnah, and the Gemara. And the Ramah is saying this in in Ashkenaz because that's the practice where he lives. Now, at the time, there was an attempt to make the curriculum in Ashkenaz more systematic. So the Maharal, who was the rabbi of Prague and a, and a slightly older contemporary of the Ramah, tried to 
make them s- stop going straight to Talmud. Right? He said, you've got to take time. First, you have, to, you have to really enforce it. First, you've got to know all of the Bible. Then you have to really learn Mishnah. And only when you've mastered the Mishnah, then you should start studying Talmud. That did not catch on either. <laughs> but um, So the remark quotes the other view, which is the one that people were, practically speaking, following. Even to this day, there are some yeshivas where they try, but it's really a minority effort to make it more uh, a sort of slower system than that. But people, a lot of parents are reluctant to send their boys to such a yeshiva because they're worried that the boys will be less advanced in Talmud because they don't start studying Talmud till much later. However, the foundation for it is, is, is more solid. So there's much to be said for that. Um, so he first quotes the view of the Tur uh, and of Rabbeinu Tam. And then he says, and a person should not study. He means what counts as Talmud Torah. It doesn't mean education. That's something else. In official Talmud Torah, the curriculum should only include scripture, Mishnah, and Gemara, and the codes, the halachic codes, that follow after them. And it's through this kind of study that you acquire this world and the world to come. Not through the study of other sciences. And then he quotes the Rivash and the Talmidim of the Rashba. That is to say, um, the students of Rabbi Shlomo ben Adret, who was the, a major halakhic authority in uh, Catalonia and part of the Spanish... Uh, the Iberian Peninsula, in the 13th century. And he, what he's referring to is the Maimonidean controversy and the ban which the, uh, the Rashba, of Shlomo ben Adret, made in 1305. So this huge fight, you know, they're changing the curriculum. The Maimonideans want to study philosophy. We don't want them to do it. They should keep teaching Talmud. And then there are other people who want to teach Kabbalah instead. You know, and there are some people in the middle who wanted to keep things the way they are. So Rav Shlomo ben Adret, who clearly was on personally not a Maimonidean, he was more on, he was a Kabbalist, but he made a ban on the teaching. That is to say, we're talking again the curriculum here. We're talking about. if somebody else goes and study it, it's a different set. But you shouldn't teach someone who's under twenty-five mm-hmm. philosophical works. And when you do it, you should only teach Jewish philosophical works. You can teach Rambam, he says, but you, know, you shouldn't be going around putting Aristotle and the Arabic commentaries on Aristotle into the Jewish syllabus. Okay, I don't think it pre- prevents someone else from going t- to read those things, but that's not in the, in the curriculum. Right? And similarly also said you shouldn't study Kabbalah until you've done other things as well. So the official curriculum... Uh, until 25, right? So that you know takes you all the way through high school and, and the equivalent of college, um, right? That would still be scripture, Mishnah, Babylonian Talmud, and the codes, halachic codes, right? Um, and then, but again, I, I said before, Ramah is not opposed to philosophy. He just says that's not the way that you get the world to come. Now, remember, for Rambam, it really is very much connected to philosophy. We saw that you know, a prophet is somebody that, who represents the greatest attainment of the human intellect. And it's through the attainment of the human intellect that you um, acquire immortality right? by attaching yourself to the, uh, to the active intellect that it informs this world. And that's really a philosophical achievement. Um, you have to do lots of other things first, right? But the, the Ramah goes on to say, um, but nevertheless, it's permitted to study, I'm not sure how, what, which is the best translation, casually or to study on the side. I take it to mean it's not, covered, it's it's not in the curriculum. Right, it's okay. It's, okay. it's a it's personal okay. thing. And he did this himself. He wrote philosophically informed works. 
right? Um, you can study the other things. Bilvad Shlo Yehu Sifrei Minim, as long as they're not the books of heretics. Which is what? That's a good, mm-hmm. good question. So he could mean the same as mm-hmm. the Rashba. He could mean that they're not Christian books or not non-Jewish books. It's unclear. Or it could mean they're not the books of Jewish heretics. Right? We'd have to try and figure that out. This is what the sages call a stroll in the orchard. Now we're going back to what the Rambam actually said. Is that written? Yes. It's a stroll in paradise. Yes. Adam but paradise rakla acha shem shem male kriso bosoviyayin. But a person shouldn't go for a stroll in the orchard until they've first filled their stomach with meat and wine. You got to know the basics first, right? For who leda isavaheta, you should know the uh, prohibitions and the permissions, for dinei hamitzvahs and the rules of the mitzvahs, and then he cites the Rambam. Hmm. So he does not he certainly does not go all the way back to the Rambam's radical position, but he wants to make sure that there's some place where it's clear that it's permitted to study philosophy, even if it's not officially part of the curriculum. So he wants to make room for the Rambam's, something like the Rambam's view. But again, you know, this is nowhere near as radical as the Rambam's view itself, which was that the study of physics and metaphysics is the culmination of, of Torah study. Now it's an additional thing that's permissible. After you're 25. <laughs> he doesn't quote that, the age. Now there's some dispute about the ban, because even in the ban itself, it says, first of all, that it's local, right? People don't make worldwide uh, decrees. Rabbis make rules and uh, rabbinic courts make rules for their own communities. It also says in the ban, this is good for 50 years and then we'll revisit it. Mm-hmm. So if someone tells you that, you know, oh, they made a ban on philosophy, that's not, it, it's not quite accurate. First of all, it's on the teaching, not the studying. Secondly, it's an age limit. Uh, and thirdly, it was local. And fourth, it was, there was a time limit on the extent of the ban anyway. But nevertheless, I think it's interesting to see how all of the major codes after the Rambam quote his words, mm-hmm. but they don't, do not adopt his, his radical view at all. And of course, the Talmud Bavli remains uh, at the center of the traditional Jewish curriculum to this day. Okay, thank you.